thank you everyone for attending um, the luncheon today for benefit providers. Um, I want you to all know that the Benefit Providers Committee is an open committee and um, we welcome newcomers for new ideas at all times, so just um, talk to Eric or myself if you want to join that committee. Um, so we have a distinguished panel here today. So the first speaker uh, is Katie LaMonica. She serves as Godolphin as the Darley Stallion Promotions Coordinator. She's a Lexington, Kentucky native and has worked for Godolphin as the Darley Stallion Promotions Coordinator since 2003 and has expanded role as American and Global Charities Manager for Godolphin. But today she's going to talk about the Thoroughbred Industry Awards. And so I'll just, um, her full biography is in the, um, in your booklets and um, I'll say for every one of the panel, I'm just going to do a short biography um, and then you can read about the full in your books. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Do I need to bend over? Can you all hear me? I talk pretty loud, so I usually don't need a microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah. It is so great to be here. I've, um, I've really enjoyed my trip so far. I uh, was in a committee this morning talking about other initiatives that I have the pleasure of working on at Godolphin. Uh, but the Thoroughbred Industry Employee Awards is very near and dear to my heart and I think a really wonderful um, initiative for our industry. So I'm excited to share a little bit. As I was looking through the list of attendees here, there are so many names on the list that are already associated with the awards. In fact, every single person sitting on this panel, I know this wasn't planned, but every single person sitting on this panel has been part of the Third Red Industry Employee Awards. Reed McClellan was our first panel chair for judging. Julio Rubio was nominated in year one. Will was a judge last year. Maria was a finalist in 2019. So they've all been touched. Susan Martin was chair of our um, judging panel. Tom Law is in the audience. He is chair next year. So it goes on and on. Um, and I just really, really appreciate this program. The HBPA has been a partner on the program since its inception. It's going into year eight. I remember meeting with Eric the first time and said, um, I've been told I have to bring this program to America. What am I going to do? And um, he said, we're in. This is great. We need to do this. So um, the HBPA has been in since the beginning, along with the Jockey Club, the Breeders' Cup, Toba, and Godolphin. So those are the main partners on it. And again, thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me here. And I'm going to. These folks, they aren't the unsung heroes. They are the heroes of our industry. And it's great to be uh, part of an event that recognizes them for, for all they do for our game. And without them, we really wouldn't have the sport or the industry that we have. I think this is one of the most wonderful experiences that I've ever had. And I can't thank you enough for nominating me. I'm just so humbled and so proud to be here. The industry is so important to me, and I know that so many of these people that are receiving these awards today have worked so hard, and they're really the backbone of the industry. They're the people that keep everything going. And, uh, you know, I, I think they should all be very pleased to even be a nominee to this thing because they're chosen by their peers. Having the opportunity to have an event like this and showcase the people that work every day to do what's best for the horse and do what's best for the people on the backside, it's, it's more than fulfilling, it, it is beyond words. Eric, I had to put you in there. Anyway, I just wanted to briefly um, go over just our award categories. Um, for the Thoroughbred Industry Employee Awards, our nominations usually open the week after Derby, and our nominations stay open through the second week of July. 
Um, we have two judging panels associated with the um, awards program. The first one is a shortlist panel. They take all the nominations in all the categories and come up with the top three finalists in each, with the exception of one award, and that is a community award. We decide a winner and a runner-up in that first panel. Then all the finalists are invited to a trip to Kentucky, and they meet the final judging panel there, get to visit horse farms, enjoy a day of racing at Keeneland, and then attend the ceremony where a winner is chosen in each of the categories. Um, so behind me just shows you a little bit of the financial breakdown of the awards. Um, for, for five of the awards, it's $7,500 to the winner with $2,500 back to their farm or organization. The reason why we do that is actually this was um, the founder's idea in England was so that there is no jealousy or animosity within the stable. If let's say if the trainer nominates one of the grooms or hot walkers and they're a finalist, then $2,500 goes back to that stable to be split between all the other employees. So instead of cheering against and you know having sort of the jealousy, it's cheering for because they're all going to get to enjoy a little bit of the success. And that's why um, we give to the farm or stable for the finalist and the winner. For the newcomer award, um, we uh, it's a little bit less because they have worked in the industry for um, a, a shorter amount of time. And then the community award, um, we, act, we give $2,500 to the charity of their choice along with a $7,500 check to the winner. This is the first uh, awards category, our leadership award category. It's spon sponsored by Hagyard. Um, it shows you the winners for the past two years just so you can get an idea of um, who was nominated and who won. You also have um, the past winners down here. But these are, um, these, where are my notes, sorry. These are your assistant trainers, assistant farm managers, farm division managers, yearling stallion broodmare, barn foreman, racetrack management. All those people would be considered in the leadership category. For the dedication to breeding award, as you can see, um, Don Jenkins, who won last year, how many years of service did he have, Will? He's 85 years old. He's 85, <laughs> and they've forced him to retire. He won't retire. He shows up every day, and they uh, nominated him to this, and it was, it was so special. Um, just I think it was over 50 years of service to Darby Dan Farm, so it was very special. Um, so the dedication to breeding category, it's broodmare grooms, stallion grooms, barn foremen, assistant and farm division managers, night watch, all that would be in the dedication to breeding category. Kind of the same goes for the dedication to racing. Um, assistant trainers, racing grooms, training grooms, hot walkers, exercise riders, barn foremen, night watch, rehabilitation technicians those types of jobs that would be nominated in the dedication to uh, racing category. The newcomer award is to someone who has worked in the industry roughly five years or less. Um, that shows that they are gonna be a shining star one day in our industry. Um, as you can see, Jonathan Estrada won it from David Donk Stable, and then Olivia from Windstar won it the year before. Not really sure why that's happening um, but it is a great category and it just highlights the young up-and-coming great great uh, workers in our industry um, the Catherine McKee administration award um, it's kind of, this one is pretty self-explanatory but it is stud secretary stallion booking administrators sales coordinators office managers racing stable secretaries racetrack or organization administrators Let's be honest, these are typically the people that keep the wheels on the bus for anybody in the stud offices, on the racetrack. So your administrators, they have their own category and they are so important. They are very much a linchpin of our industry. So we um, gave them their own category about four or five years ago. It is named after Catherine McKee who worked at Keeneland. They sponsor this category. She passed away from cancer um, just a few years ago, but she was a tremendous person. 
Um, this one is also named for, I'm sure you all, a lot of you all are familiar with uh, Doc Richardson, who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago as well. Churchill sponsors this award. Um, Doc Richardson was a mainstay on the backside of Churchill Downs. Um, and so the award is named in his honor. Um, the community award is for someone who works in and around our industry, but doesn't necessarily have to be on the end of a shank. We've had two chaplains win this award. Nick Carreras obviously won it. Izzy Vega from California won it in the first year. We've had aftercare people win it. Um, we have had HBPA people nominated in this category. So it's a fairly big catch-all category, but also incredibly important for the work that everyone here does. And this is one, this is our newest category because we were trying to take a lot of people that didn't fit in the other categories and force them into where they didn't fit. This has become um, kind of my favorite category just because of, it just showcases all the different um, jobs in our industry. This one is sales staff, auctioneers, gardeners, veterinary practices, farriers, starting gate crew, horse transport, um, sales companies, racehorse, dentists, psychotherapists, whatever it is, it is a catch-all, but also it is important. And I wanted to highlight Laura Shear, who won it last year. She is a crossing guard at Naira and incredibly special, and when we announced that she was a finalist, I had at least five trainers in New York send me a text telling me how much they love Laura and how excited she was and what a wonderful job she did every morning in the snow, in the rain, that Laura was the best. So we brought Laura to Lexington. That was an experience. She was a lot of fun. Um, and then Brenda from Charlestown, won it the year before, and um, it was very special to bring Brenda in. So again, it's $122,000 that Godolphin gives towards these awards, the actual prize money, but it is so much more than that. It's a trip to Kentucky, and we really do make an, you know, we really do recognize and reward these individuals. Where I could use some help from this room is when you walk around your racetracks or wherever you go, if there are people that you watch doing tremendous jobs, please help us get nominations for those people. A lot of times it's making that connection of, oh, I've got the best guy, I don't know what I would do without him, he's just the greatest. Well, nominate him. Go online and nominate him for the awards program. Let us recognize him for all the service that he does. So I could really use your all's continued support of the program just to garner nominations. And if you have any questions about, well, I've got this person, but I don't know which category, please reach out. We are happy to answer any questions whatsoever. And if you all would like to be involved in the awards process some other way, please let us know. Um, and again, the nominations will open on May 8th and close on the 14th. And um, to explain that a little bit more, I have Maria coming up. So um, thank you all very much. Oh, she doesn't want to stand. She's going to sit. Okay, Maria Catagnani is... Um, the executive director of the Charlestown HBPA, and she served in that position since 2011. And before that, from 2008 to 2011, she held the same position for Mountaineer Park. Uh, Maria is a strong supporter of the Thoroughbred Industry Employee Awards and has been a finalist for the administration award herself in 2019 and the successful nominator of Darla Gage, who you saw her picture on there earlier, um, a Charlestown employee to win the award in 2022. So Maria is going to explain on how you can nominate people that you know in the industry. Thanks, Marianne, and thanks for getting my last name right. <laughs> I've known Eric a long time and still can't say my last name. <laughs> anyway, um, um, I'm very proud to say that I was the 2019, a 2019 finalist in the administrative category of the Godolphin Thoroughbred Industry Employee Award. Um, peer recognition for hard work, commitment, and dedication is an honor, and it's very personally rewarding, and so I'm thankful for that recognition. 
so about the rewards. Um, anyone can submit a nomination, a horseman, any horseman, a groom, an owner, a trainer, a farm, a breeder, any other business. Um, you know, it's wide open, so you really, really need to look around you and see who you have in your community that is involved with horse racing, horse breeding, just anything in the industry. Um, it's a very simple process. Um, we've helped horsemen write and review their nominations at the HBPA, and we've also submitted our own nominations. So we, we sort of you know, try to help it along because we want to encourage um, we want to encourage anybody on the backside specifically who wants to, to make a nomination to do so. Um, so um, from our perspective, deciding, deciding who to nominate takes a little bit of time. Internally, we discuss who to nominate and why and what category they fit into. And Katie explained the categories. Um, once we've identified what we believe to be the best category, category for our candidates, we begin our own process. And our first step is to let the candidates know that we plan to submit them as a nominee. And the reason we do that is because someone may not want to participate. There might be a personal reason, and we have actually had um, somebody who has asked us not to submit their name. Um, the application process is in, is in an essay format. Um, and I would advise that because you're competing against so many nominees, that it's important that your answers are very specific and very descriptive. Um, writing the essay requires a job description and listing job duties, but it's more than a technical piece. The nominees have been called unsung heroes, so you need to describe the little things that they do that go unnoticed. The descriptions tell who the person really is and how they make a difference in the, in the racing industry. Express how they care about the people and animals around them. Tell a story that evokes emotion in the reader. A lot of people read the applications, and that's how you get chosen. So if you can describe the, the inner being of who that person is, then that's very helpful. It, 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 um, you have to evoke, that's the best thing I can say is tell a story that evokes emotion. Um, I'll give you an example. Every morning, one of our grooms, Joe, picks up a, coffee, uh, picks up a cup of coffee at a local fast food restaurant. And when he leaves, he always grabs two extra creamers and brings them to the barn, but the creamers aren't for his coffee. It's a treat for the little tabby cat that Joe greets every morning before his workday gets started. So he opens the little, kit, the little container and he puts it down to the little cat and stares at him and walks and waits, waits till the little tabby drinks the, the milk and then he goes about his business. You know, that picks a, paints a picture for the reader to, to, to get a feeling of what's inside Joe's heart and who he is and how compassionate is he is and how he cares for his animals and he cares for the people around him. That simple gesture sets Joe apart from others in the day-to-day -day routine. It shows he's kind and caring and compassionate. Sure, he shows up on time and mucks stalls and water and fills water buckets, but what else does he do to enhance the environment around him? Describe what makes him or her stand out. Write about their family, especially if there's a connex connection to the industry. We write about passion for what he or she does and how they do it. Describe their, per their personality and what makes them relatable. <coughs> I'm proud to say that Charlestown has submitted TIEA nominations since 2018, and, and I've attended four awards ceremonies in the last six years to support Charlestown nominees. In addition to being a finalist myself, three nominees have been finalists, and two of those three went in to be winners of their respective categories. Um, and Brenda, who um, was the 2020, 2021 winner, she actually, we nominated her, and she is actually the track kitchen vendor. So the, the categories for support services are wide open, you know, uh, the category is wide open as to the kinds of jobs that you can nominate people from. Um, in 2018, one of our horsemen nominated a groom who was a finalist. Our track kitchen vendor was um, the winner of the support services category in 2020. And in 2022, I'm, again, proud to say that we nominated my office assistant in the administrative support category. Um, each time that one of us was announced as a finalist, the chatter in the Charlestown community, um, <clears throat> the compliments, the congratulatory greetings and well wishes all created a positive atmosphere and camaraderie, which was 
particularly in the midst of COVID and post-COVID, a morale boost for everyone. The nomination and award is something positive that everybody can get behind and can root for. Um, every one of us who attended the awards as finalists will tell you that it's an incredible experience that we'll never forget. Yes, there's a cash award for being a finalist and a fabulous trophy for the winner, which I didn't get. <laughs> but more importantly, I'm not a judge. Wait a minute, I should do I'm this. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure there's a judge out there that was on your panel. Uh, <laughs> but more importantly, you need to know that Katie and her staff have created a total experience of events that is unforgettable. The hospitality extended to the finalists, their friends and family, is incredibly generous and exceptional. The experience includes an all-expense-paid accommodation for, a, for the finalists and a plus one, farm tours, meals, award ceremony, and a day at the races at Keeneland. And finalists are welcome to bring friends and family, family along to share the experience, which makes the experience even more special. One of the highlights of the event is the farm tours. The finalists and guests are afforded the opportunity and exposure to some of the most prestigious breeding farms and famous horses in the industry. <coughs> um, before the, this experience, the three finalists from Charlestown never had the opportunity to visit Kentucky Farms to see some of the big names in breeding and racing, and this was an amazing experience for them. Over the, over the years, some of the farms that we've visited were John Abel, Lane's End, Ashford and Stone Street, and some of the amazing thoroughbreds that we've seen include Medallia Doro, AP Indy, American Pharaoh, Justify, and of course my personal favorite, Rachel Alexandra. The opportunity to see and touch those horses was awe-inspiring for these people. The horses and places that they had only read about suddenly became tangible, and the best part was they got to share it with their families. So the next time you see that email that advertises the awards, I encourage you to think about the people that are all around you and that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and consider nominating someone from in your world who makes a difference because they're all around us. I'd like to thank a Dolphin, the National HBPA, TOBA, the Jockey Club, the Breeders' Cup, and all the people that are the support behind the scenes who have made this program such an incredible one. And if I could create my own award, I'd give one to Katie LaMonica for her outstanding and talents and intelligence. And she didn't make it so oh, thank you. But she didn't give me one of those green awards. I should have uh, gotten the time for your uh, talk before I put these Medicare knees down squatting for that long. <laughs> but I made it. I got back up pretty quick. Okay. Um, the next person speaking is one that we all know well, um, Dr. Reed McClellan. He's the founder of the Groom Elite Horseman's Education Program, um, otherwise known as the man in purple, Dr. Mac. Um, he's taught people to work with horses, particularly race horses, for most of his life and all of his 48-year professional career. Starting with one class at Lone Star Park, the Groom Elite program has been taught to over 5,000 individuals at 32 racetracks in 16 states, plus tracks in Canada, South Africa, Trinidad, Tobago, and St. Lucia. Um, I'll also say at, in Emerald Downs, he, it was amazing to see him one week teaching a group of 40 grooms, and uh, I think it was a few weeks later he came and we did a, um, we're owned by the Muckleshoot Indian tribe and we did a day camp for the kids from the tribe and it was just amazing to see him transition from the different students. So he's one of my favorites, uh, Dr. McLeod. I was actually supposed to go first, but because of 3231, I think they felt like that Alabama should go in front of LSU. <laughs> 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 We've had that we've had that ongoing and, and I've worked, as she said, with them on that very first couple of years and it's it's sensational to read the different stories. But the one thing I will tell you, if you nominate somebody, you nominate them, don't say they show up for work every day and they don't miss a day. That's what they're supposed to do. Right? And that's what we teach them in in the Groom Elite classes. Part of what we do is teach them to respect the business. And just as a quick annual report, you can go online, groomelite.com, uh, and see the annual report if you want to see what we've done. We did some work down in St. Croix, 
Uh, we got a round pin built, got an instructor down there that's got a donkey, an island pony, and a thoroughbred. We don't have any inmates because island time is different from stateside time. So maybe this year I spent about 80 hours designing a barn. The barn's designed. They've got it down there. It's supposed to be built. It'll probably be built, and I may not ever get to see it. That's how fast they work in the island. Let's put it that way. And then we did... Dream Elite 99 and 101 at Colonial Downs was one of the first tracks that we did outside the state of Texas. We had a good group there uh, of interested people. We have seven prisons that I work with. We lost one prison to one in Illinois this year, but we picked up one in Wyoming, or at least I thought I was going to finally get to go to Wyoming. I've been there, but not to teach a class. And I kept wondering why I was going, kept the girl at, at Walk Hill, the first prison in New York, which we started with a couple of years ago, and she kept saying, well, this one, after you come here, you can just go to Wyoming. I said, well, you know, well, that's a long way. You know, I can't get there the next day. Well, Wyoming's actually in Attica, and most of you know what's in Attica, right? So we do have a, we picked up that program, and then here in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to Sykesville, which came back online, and certifying or giving assessments to four grooms there. I've worked with Blackburn out of Lexington. They do a great job there. They put on a horse show every year, and the guys show what they can do. And they, every one of them that graduates can go work in the horse industry if they want to. And then the Veterans and Human Rehabilitation Programs. It started with Healing Hearts out in California, and they only did one or two a year, and the different ones, they've moved on to other things. They still offer the program. But uh, horse Sensing in Baghdad, Kentucky, if you want to go look at their website, they're doing a tremendous job there. They have residence houses for both veteran men and women, and they can go and spend nine months there and get certified as a groom elite and show horse groom. And then I went to Thoroughbred Horses of Saratoga uh, in April last year and Endeavor Thoroughbred uh, Therapeutic Horses in Bedford Corners, New York, and there are two more veteran and uh, human rehabilitation programs that are now Groom Elite certified and I'll be working with them this year on actually getting their first grooms in the program and getting those certified. And in a little bit, you're gonna, you'll hear a little bit more about some stuff that started last fall. Uh, this year, I've taught it Florida, January and February. And as I said, I'm going to Sykesville in a couple of weeks. And I'm also gonna be talking to a farm in the mid-Atlantic area. We may have a residence Groom Elite farm where people can actually go and get trained and then go and start working. But I'll have to let you know that after I actually have that meeting on March the 23rd and 24th. And then we have an H3 visa situation coming on and I'm gonna let the lawyers talk about that. But what, what I'm gonna do right now is talk about just a little brief segment of one of the classes we teach. When I, taught, when I start out teaching classes and I tell the grooms it makes any difference whether I'm teaching those kids that we had such a great time with out there in Washington all the way up to, to <coughs> trainers and people that are doing training continuing education. We start with horse behavior. And that's what this segment comes from that. And it has to do with something that is very important. I was reading an article last week and it said the four things that cause relationships to fail. And the first one was failure to communicate. And so it, it had me think about this particular segment of the class. Here is an individual that had it all her way for a long time. And she got put in a pasture where she was no longer the boss. Things didn't go her way. Somebody was setting rules that she didn't like and what we learn is, is the way that we approach communicating sometimes with our body language and with our words and with our attitudes, you know, which end is closer and how our tail's working and where we're stomping our feet, sometimes influences the communication. And then we have the inquisitive body language. These two horses both at one point were uh, horses that were the dominant horse in their particular group and now a new one has come in 
and they're asking the question is, how are you going to fit in? Are you going to fit in with us? You're going to do it the right way? You're going to do it the way we said? And you know what happens right after this picture was taken, right? One of those horses squealed. And it makes no difference which one of them squealed. If there's a groom standing close to them, they're in danger because they're just moving. And that sometimes happens when we start squealing a little bit. So when we listen to their body language, we, we think about focused horses. We think about relaxed horses. We see these kinds of horses. And the first thing we think of is, oh, man, that's a mean one. But what I point out to the grooms is that while they might appear mean, these two horses are scared. And sometimes when we're communicating things, we don't realize that the person we're communicating with is scared of what the outcome is going to be. And if they're backed into a stall and they're scared, then they're going to escape. And when they run over the groom, both they can get hurt and the groom can get hurt. So we need to be aware of that as we're going through there. See the difference? This is aggression. And as I point out to the grooms, they can be handled, but professional help might be necessary. And sometimes, even in our personal relationships, if we get aggressive, we know that professional help is sometimes necessary. So we look at different things that horses have. Here's one where they're beginning to realize there's going to be some give and take. We can't both be the, the leader in this particular herd. But we can't all learn to play in the same pasture. We might have to stay out of each other's way, but we can learn how to play in that same pasture. And every now and then, we walk down a driveway covered in snow, and the horse is walking right alongside of me. And I think about it. You know, neither one of us like where we are, but at least the two of us are in peace and harmony. And I think sometimes we need to look at that as we think about all of the different things that we as a group of horsemen want to do. Because in another room, there might be another group of horsemen that don't agree with us. But the one thing they do agree on is and what they think is, is that what they are doing is also in the best interest of the horse. And that's where it all by, comes back down to. We have to keep our focus on what is in the best interest of the horses. And I think that's what we, we do here to a, to a great extent. And so let's keep that in mind. And I'm going to turn this over to Mary Ann and she can introduce Will. And we'll tell you about the H3 <coughs> information that we're going to have coming up this year. Thank you, Reed. Uh, our next two speakers are Will Velli and Julio Rubio, who will give us an update on the guest workers. Will is an attorney and CEO of Horseman's Labor Solution. He has been affiliated with the National HBPA since 2008. He has been practicing immigration law for almost two de decades. Will's main interest is in equine sports, representing many trainers, jockeys, and horsemen. And I'll say we have a lot of attorneys in <coughs> Seattle, and I'm sure a lot of immigration attorneys. but. When a horseman calls me and, and needs assistance, um, even though Will's in Oklahoma, he's always my first call. And the main reason is because I know he's gonna take care of the horseman and he's not going to collect their money before he knows he can help them. And that's really been a, a positive thing and our horsemen trust him as well now. Julio is the Hispanic and Backside Service Coordinator for the Kentucky HBPA, a position he has held since 2003. Julio has served the Kentucky HBPA since 2003. His duties include field representative and liaison between the stable area track workers, trainers, and track administration. Both of their biographies can be found in your conference binder. So which one of you is gonna go first? Well, both of us except me. So okay. Can we split it then? Why not? Okay. Do we have a <coughs> iPad for us? Uh, Reed, you take the... Uh, are they are they not the same? Because it's not the same. No, but where's the... Thank you, um, everyone, for uh, your time. Um, thanks, Eric, for inviting me. Thank you, President Chowden and Director Panassi, for putting on such a great conference. Um, New Orleans never disappoints. Uh, you know, Mr. Hicks, I'm going to put a little bit closer. Okay. 
Orleans this year. Yeah, uh, New Orleans never disappoints, and uh, we sure appreciate the opportunity to be here every time. Um, yeah, if I can uh, paraphrase the the president, uh, you know, I've come here to address the State of the Union. State of the Union is strong. We actually have seen a sea change in the approach that the government has taken towards uh, not only the horse industry, but particularly the horse industry through actions from the HBPA and um, some of the other associations, but also a combination of uh, maybe a change of administration, but also just the realities of how the economy is post-COVID. Uh, there's acute labor shortage, uh, supply chain interruptions, inflation, and, and that's brought the government around to understanding that we're not trying to displace Americans, we're trying to fill really important foundational level jobs. I was at a, um, it, it, a, a stakeholders convention for all the different industries that do H2B visas and the Department of Labor was there, uh, State Department was there, and CIS was there. They never show up to these. And the uh, immigration CIS, the head of H2B, thanked us for being partners in uh, trying to meet the critical labor shortage. And uh, they've never really ever treated us anything but maybe a somebody to try to police and, and somebody to dislike. And so it, it, there has been a substantial change in, in how uh, the government is approaching. Uh, and, it, and like I said, it's not just the administration because um, it, was, it was kind of acute in the last administration, but even under President Obama, their approach was that every job that a visa takes is a job taken from an American. And that's not how it works. These, these, the people that are coming here to work aren't displacing Americans. They're coming here to fill you know, these jobs that without them, we can't have the higher level professional jobs. So, uh, you know, we're, we're proud to, uh, to work with the industry. Um, one thing I was gonna talk about, um, I'll get down to the, the everyday things that we do on the, you know, the H2B visas, which is for the, you know, the grooms, the hot walkers and, and the people that, you know, we need to, to run the stables. But um, I'm gonna go back in time and, and for some reason the, the introduction said that I've been with, uh, working with the HBPA since 2008, but it's actually 2005. I went back and found an old petition that we did for H3 workers from 2005, it was dated. And um, it was my very first conference and um, I remember I was watching Reed and he said, look, you guys don't have to pay me at all, but I need enough money just to put gas in my car to go from track to track so I can put on these clinics and I, I just need the support that we need to be able to put on the program. And I, I started thinking that there's this visa for training that would be a perfect fit for the Groom Elite program. It, it's, it's not a work visa and it's not for the kind of foundational level jobs, but it's for the next level up, the assistant trainers, the people that are gonna be certified. Um, and so I thought, you know, if we could meet the need of the, of the trainers and if they get the, the people that they need, they can contribute financially to the Groom Elite program, which will enable us to continue our mission to offer it at no charge to the American workers. And so we actually, that first year, I was a little bit over ambitious. I was, I was, we were swinging for the fences. We actually put in four petitions for 50 each for Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, and Kentucky. And we were approved in about a week. We thought, wow, this is great. We're, you know, we're never gonna have to do H2B visas again. But then when it came time to take the guys through the consulate and the State Department, they said, wait, no, these guys are having H2Bs for years, so we don't think this is gonna work. And so we went back to the drawing board. But um, about three or four months ago, uh, Remy called and he's got a breeding farm and he wanted to do a training visa. And th there's another type of training visa, it's only good for a year. The H3 is good for two years. Um, the other type of visa, which is called a J1, you have to pay a private company about $4,000 and they quote unquote administer the program, which they, they just basically kind of take your money and, and they're deputized by the State Department. Well, if we can cut that, party out, the H3, which is good for two years, um, the, the thing about the H3 program is it has to be a program where the primary mission is that people are being trained so that they can go back to their home country and have a good productive uh, uh, working opportunity. And that's what Groom Elite does. It, it, this is nothing that we're, we're trying to uh, you know, find a, a work visa in place of a training visa. The, the Groom Elite program will train people at the, you know, the culmination of their second year, they're gonna be uh, able to be certified as either an elite groom or an assistant trainer. And so in the last two weeks alone, we, and what's, what's nice about what Reed's been doing, because we've been working with uh, Remy and Reed, uh, not to just make this for race trackers, but to make it for breeding farms, 
a uh, couple weeks ago we filed one for a reigning horse farm. Um, and this can be, it can be taken and adapted to, you know, the Western sports and the different disciplines so that this is an opportunity for people to come in from other parts of the, the world and come and learn, you know, the best techniques in the world, which are right here, and then go back out. And when they go back out, they become ambassadors and emissaries of the American horse industry. And, and that's uh, the way we argued it back in 2005 and the way we argue it now is that this is the way that we increase our global footprint. We, we can increase our opportunities globally through providing them the world class, class training um, that Groom Elite offers. And at the same time, it meets our practical needs of, of at least helping to fund the program. Uh, whenever we go speak in, in DC, um, uh, we will, the first thing we do is we break out the Groom Elite book, put it on the table with Department of Labor, because they say, you know, why, why do you need a visa program? We'll give them the Groom Elite book and we'll say, we offer this at 35 different places, eight different correctional facilities at no cost. The industry pays for it themselves, no cost to the Americans. But despite our best efforts, we still can't find the workers that we need to meet our needs. So if, if we can combine the, the, the needs that the trainers have and they can contribute to the program, then we're going to be uh, solving two problems and, and doing a lot of good for uh, the industry and also you know, the Americans that we, we need and want to stay involved in the industry. And just some basic things, I won't get too deep into the weeds, but we have to make sure that it's a program that is not primarily for uh, productive employment, that this is a training program that has work as part of the component for, um, for the program. And the way this is going to work, it's broken into two 52-week curriculums that have, at the end of each section, they have to, um, trainer has to sign a contract with Groom Elite that they're going to oversee the program, that they're going to ensure that the, the, the trainee uh, is taking part in it, that there's measurable metrics that, that uh, Reed and, and the people that Reed works with can, can monitor and make sure that they're progressing, and that there's, a, there's a, um, an achievement at the end that can be certified. And so that, that's the program, and um, it's not going to be for, the, like I said, the foundational level folks, but it can, it can reach out and help a lot of people. And we just, in our office alone, we probably do J visas. We probably do 50 a year. And we don't like J visas because they're only good for a year and they're really expensive. And um, so we could easily double that or more, just, you know, whatever the capacity that Reed says. Once Reed says stop, we'll stop. But um, as long as we can... Um, you know, do it within the, the spirit of the law, and, and uh, it, it's a good program. Gas is a lot more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that's that's essentially A3. You got anything on that? No, we just, uh, I've worked with it. The, the uh, first year is out, and as he said, there will be a certified instructor or certified assessor that would evaluate the progress of, of these individuals at the end they'll actually be able to, they'll be qualified as he said nowadays with the new rules that are coming in with regard to licensing and stuff but they will be qualified to take the trainer's exam to be an assistant trainer and they will have to go all the way through the rules of racing so it's that level that we're we're talking about there not we're not going to be training people that have never worked with horses before necessarily to become just workers on the backside. We still do that with our basic grooming 99 and 101, but I didn't say this year we've already got commitments from Iowa and Virginia will be doing classes at, at those two tracks. And uh, the other thing that I haven't said yet is that this is probably going to be my last year to do this. So if, you know, if we're, we're going to get this done and then I've got some things I'm going to do. And, you know, I'm going to fill that car up and down the road I go. And it's going to be somewhere to a racetrack, probably somewhere, but it won't be to teach. That's all I'm going to say about that. That's a large horse to work. Um, yeah, just, uh, just to give you real-life examples, so in the last two weeks, we filed two for breeding farms. One was a thoroughbred breeding farm. One was a, a reigning horse breeding farm, uh, an assistant trainer for a reigning horse, and then uh, spoke and confirmed with an assistant trainer here at Fairgrounds that wants to uh, go ahead and get to the next level. So uh, two are from France, one's from Ireland, and uh, one's from Brazil. So it, it, it's got a, a real international component to it. Um, so Julio, do you have anything on these three, or should we move to the next one? Okay, so 
FH3, and now we get back to what we do with um, on the day-to-day. -day. Uh, this is what, you know, when I said everything's great, it's not perfect. You know, there's the there's an arbitrary quota imposed by the federal government every year that there's a certain number of visas, which is 66,000. Um, in 2021, there were 96,000 for 30, uh, well, sorry, there's a fall quota of 33,000 and a spring quota of 33,000. For the 33,000 available spots in 2021, there were 96,000. So it was a one in three chance of getting picked. In 2022, for 33,000 spots, there were 136,000 applications. So you're about a one in five chance. This year, there were 142,000 for 33,000 spots. So you can see that there's a lot of competition and um, scarcity when it comes to the H-2B visa. And that's the visa for labor that doesn't, you have to show there's no Americans available to fill the job. You have to run a job order with the Department of Labor, hire any Americans. We require no experience, no education. Uh, we do everything in the best faith possible with the Department of Labor. We'll hire anybody that wants to work. And despite that, you know, we'll run the job order for 30 days and nobody, nobody applies for the job. It's just where we are right now. And I don't have to say that to any of y'all. Y'all know that better than me. I remember John, Moss uh, said that he had owners mucking out their stalls last year, and so what can we do? And it's that's where we are. But um, some good news this year: the um, the federal government doubled the allocation uh, from sixty six thousand to um, one hundred and thirty thousand. Uh, there's some restrictions on the extra visas; they have to be workers that are from uh, that have had visas in the last three years. So they have to be workers that are from the triangle countries. Um, the triangle countries are El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, this was done in negotiation with those countries to help stop the, you know, the border caravans that we hear so much on uh, television that really kind of muddies up the whole concept of immigration reform because if you can put on television, you know, scary pictures of thousands of people coming at the borders, then you can kind of stop, you know, you can dominate the optics and stop any talk of proactive fixes. So so um, Julio is going to talk a little bit about uh, the people on the backside of the track from Guatemala. Well, what I was going to mention also is a lot of times when trainers call the, they need workers and they want to start the visa program, we have, through the years, we have a, a good network of, of experienced grooms and exercise riders that have came before, especially like from Guatemala. And um, a lot of times uh, a, a trainer you know, would feel more comfortable with somebody that's already d been here before and has done the work. And so uh, we've been able to place a lot of the workers uh, with, with uh, the trainers. Um, and also um, the, you know, as you, as you walk barns across the country, um, you find out that the, the Guatemala, there's a growing uh, population of Guatemalans, uh, probably more than Mexicans now. And so, um, a lot of times with a, with a trainer, um, it's, it's always good to bring somebody from the same country where the, the workers that they currently have, that way they, you know, they, they feel more comfortable working for, uh, with, with family members or, or acquaintances that from, the, from the same country. Um, also, we've also, uh, El Salvador, uh, now uh, there's uh, El Salvador, uh, we're trying to uh, place workers also from that country. Uh, for uh, the trainers, which uh, hopefully it'll 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 work out, um, and you know, so we've been doing this what ten years, probably more than ten years. Two thousand eight, two thousand eight, and um, you know, it's uh, it's always like Will said. Um, even though we try and place, you know, Americans, uh, we can't find them, and so uh, it's 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 always good to uh, to have that opportunity to bring. Uh, Central Americans, although we also do Mexico, we do a lot of Mexico. Um, so far, uh, it's worked out pretty good. Yeah, and I'd like to take that and go back to this slide. This is, I put this same slide in last year. This is what is our best, this is what a, our best kept secret is, is that back in 2011, we hit a roadblock where the Department of Labor said that uh, we have a, a year round need, so we couldn't have visas. And we explained to them and, and convinced them that the need is, is uh, dictated by location. So if a trainer goes from Kentucky in the summer to Louisiana in the winter, that's considered two needs that don't overlap and don't make you ineligible to take part in the program. 
why that's important is that um, if you can bring the workers in in the fall, there's not pressure on the quota. You, the, the quota is only busy in the summer because everybody, all the landscapers, all the construction wants to do summer visas. In the winter, it's just resorts, tree planters, and horsemen. So if we're able to bring our people in in the winter, once they're in, they're not subject to the quota for the next three years. And so we've been able, because of Eric's hard work and Remy's hard work before him, we, we spent four years going to Washington, D.C. and, you know, run into a brick wall, but we, we got it worked out and we have a special accommodation that no other industry has. And when I was at that stakeholders meeting a couple weeks ago, looking at the, you know, the gnashing of teeth of all these industries that are competing for one out of every six visas available. And I'm just saying, oh, we're, we're pretty good here. Don't worry about us. You guys go ahead and fight for your visas. We're not going to tell you why we're okay, but um, it's because of the HBPA um, advocacy that we've been able to, you know, come to that accommodation with, um, with Department of Labor and Immigration. And, and, you know, sometimes it feels like the lobbying doesn't get anything done, but, you know, sometimes that hard work on the ground really pays off. And in this case, uh, you know, like I said, it's our secret, so let's not go brag to the other industry, but um, it has made our, our lives a lot easier. Especially because the workers, uh, they don't have, like, when you couldn't do that, the workers would have to leave and the trainers would be left with no workers and that would, you know, they would be hurting, but now, we were able to extend it for up to three years without them leaving the country, which is, works out for, you know, the, the big trainers that have outfits of in different uh, states. And it's worked out so far. And also, uh, what uh, trainers didn't know and the workers, uh, when you're on an extension, you're allowed to leave the country on vacation. So, for example, we have a trainer. I'm looking for this. Okay. So, <laughs> 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 so um, trainer X. Trainer X, yeah. <laughs> it's, he's over here. Uh, they uh, they have so many horses and workers that we've been bringing that um, now we're about to bring some more workers, but some of the workers that have been here on extensions for you know, two years, they want to go see their family members. So they're, you know, they're, they're going, they're going and we're bringing them in uh, on a, uh, with their extension, which is great. Uh, some, some promising uh, developments in the last, this happened in December, every December, they have to get a budget done because the budget expires in October. They do an extension until December, and then at the end of December, so the government doesn't run out of money, they put a big bill together, which is how HISA got through. We all know how the omnibus works. It's, it's pretty ugly as um, watching sausage get made. There were two bills that almost got through in this last one, and they both specifically um, help the equine industry. This one was the most uh, promising. It was called the Affordable and Secure Food Act. And what it did was it created a 10-year pathway to citizenship for undocumented uh, farm workers, and it specifically included equine, which included racetrack. It, they talked about it before. It was going to leave out racetrack workers who were trying to figure out how to shoehorn everybody into the farm. Um, but this time, they actually included us in the program. It gets us over to H2 visas, visas H2A visas, which I've a little complicated, but it was gonna, the most promising was that it was going to help us. You know, there's probably you know, hundreds, there's lots of people that are undocumented in the horse industry. I don't want to throw out numbers, but we want to help them. That's kind of the, the great goal is if we can never get those guys across. They've been here for 20 years. A lot of the last amnesty was in 2001. These are just hardworking folks. They're contributing to the economy. They're not taking anything away. And, and so if we can get them across the finish line, then I'll look back at everything I've been doing for the last 25 years, you know, with some satisfaction. Yeah, and also the, uh, what we've been doing, uh, the workers, the, the trainers that have been work, bringing their workers for years, now they've had the opportunity to become permanent residents to their firm, which is, you know, great because a lot of them, you know, they, they love coming to the States and, and working, but they always have to leave their families, but now, We've been able to get them their green card and, and that they can bring their family members also. And so that's worked out. And they're still working for the trainers, so which is which is great. It works out good for everybody. <coughs> yeah, we've kind of put ourselves out of business with one of our favorite Canterbury trainers because everybody now has green cards so they don't need <laughs> H2B anymore. But that's, that's a happy ending. Canterbury is good. Yeah, you make sure that you use these two gentlemen as a resource because it's amazing what they've accomplished over the the last few years. I mean, uh, we've been using them for a long time, and uh, I'm glad to see that you can actually find us workers, too. So I'm going to bring that message home. So. You guys
guys can all leave. Thank Just you. I want to thank everybody on yeah. the panel. We're going to. Okay, we're, we're going to keep going here um, for kind of a, a fun new uh, tradition that we're starting here called Living Legends. Becoming a living legend is about doing something extraordinary or having a unique skill and endurance. We all know someone or have someone in our lives who may not be a household name, but we consider them legendary. Our high regard for a person isn't contingent on them being world famous. It's about what value or, or what we admire about them. And so it is with Don Simmons. He is the third member of our organization to be recognized as an HBPA living legend. The first two were Marty Maline and Judge Bill Walmsley. The Stemmons family has raced horses in South Louisiana for eight generations. The benefit of that experience was shared with other trainers in 1968 when Don and Janet Stemmons opened their first tack shop. Ever since, the Stemmons name has meant superior knowledge, an excellent product line, and true customized service in the racehorse industry. Don was a starter at Evangeline Downs and served on the board of the Louisiana Thoroughbred Breeders Association for over 20 years. He also operates Stemmons Horse Supply and serves customers at Evangeline Downs and throughout Louisiana. His father was a horseshoer too, and Don prides himself on his own horseshoeing know-how. I've had horses all my life, not always racehorses. I used to do a little amateur calf roping. I never rode in a race. I wish I could have raced a quarter horse. And interviewing uh, Don is Kevin Delahousse, a board member at Louisiana HBPA. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, received a call, I guess about a week ago, 10 days, and it said, uh, look, we're going to present a living legend award at your meeting. I kind of got quiet, and it said it was going to be Don Stemmons. And my answer was, hmm, let me think about it, which was really untrue. I, I said yes so fast. Uh, I've been knowing Mr. Don since I'm 13. I'm only 25. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> But I've been in the banking business for 30 years, and a, a bank was not the first person to give me a line of credit. Mr. Stimmons it was. Because I wanted a race horse so bad, my, I guess being a Delahousie, uh, I didn't get the Eddie Delahousie gene. I got the <laughs> big Delahousie gene. But I wanted a race horse so bad, so my grandpa said, you want a race horse? Well, guess what? Go buy your equipment. And I'm thinking, hmm, you only pay me 13 bucks a week. How am I going to afford a 
Holter, Shank, et cetera, et cetera. So I called Mr. Don, and Mr. Don and my grandfather were best friends. You know, uh, Louisiana is known for gambling. Well, guess what? They would gamble on the backside. They play cards. They get their group together. And I think they had a little conglomerate going on because I think the only two people that ever won was my grandpa and Mr. Don. Uh, but he, Mr. Don has been an icon in the business. I'm 67. So 50 plus years. So uh, I'm going to I'm gonna ask you all a question and I want you all to, to raise your hand. Uh, my daughter asked me what a living legend meant. And she, she's a doctor and she's very aggressive. She took after her mother, not her dad. And uh, she, she got kind of aggravated. She's like, can you explain to me what a living legend is? Because she said, I'm so tired of us giving awards to people that are dead. She said, we need to appreciate the people that are living. And I said, you know what, sister, you have a point. She said, well, are you presenting an award to a dead person? I said, no. I said, he's very much alive, 80 plus years. And I said, so I'm going to ask you a question in the definition of a living legend. And if, if you have done all of this, well, guess what? You deserve an award to your living legend. As I said earlier, Mr. Don started out in the oil field business. His father was a horseshoe. Well, guess what? Mr. Don followed in his dad's footprints. Uh, he owned a tax shop. He was a, a breeder. He was on the association board. He was on the ABPA board. Uh, he was a starter at, at the tracks. Uh, he owns a tax shop. Uh, trainer, assistant trainer. Uh, so has anybody in this room followed that criteria, done any of this? Please raise your hand. So that shows you why he's up here today. Because, and correct me if I forget anything, <laughs> he has done everything. And he, he was most probably, he, not most probably, he is one of the most respected men in the business. Uh, Don has three children. Uh, only one kind of followed him in the business. He has a daughter that's uh, in sports medicine. Yeah. He has a son that works for the government. And he has a daughter that is a celebrity now. She just got elected as mayor of Karen Grove, which is one of the fastest growing cities in Louisiana. So if you get a chance, show, stand up, please. So if you get a chance to meet her and talk to her, she's very shy. <laughs> she doesn't like to talk. She's non-argumentative. Right, Bernard? That's our, our, that's our president. She'll tell you. But, but it's good to have these kind of people in the industry. Uh, Louisiana is known uh, for horse racing. We've had a lot of famous people come out of Louisiana, not to knock any other state here. Please, please don't take that the wrong way. But we've been fortunate. But we're, we're losing the type of people that we need in horse racing. Uh, I think Mr. Don told me this will be his last term, which I'm going to fight. Oh, yeah. I'm going to argue with him. Oh, I'm yeah. going to pull a Charlotte, it's and I'm going to argue with him. It's done. But we need these type of people to be recognized and these type of people to stay in the business. You know, Charlotte's daughter worked for Mr. Don. And he, he, we laughed and we were laughing. And uh, they kind of go back and forth, like a granddaughter and a grandfather. Uh, he's like, she don't ever get on time. Said, you know, I have a bit to be there for 7, and she gets there at 7.30, so I make a deal with her to get, to get there at 7.30, and she gets there at 8 o'clock. <laughs> so I think it's in the genes where she takes after her mother, she likes to argue a little. But having this, these people here, this type of person in the horse industry is uh, unbelievable. Uh, I can't say enough about him. Uh, he's been lucky to have two great women in his life, in his life, uh, Miss Janet and Miss Diane. So, and you know, and, and oh, I forgot what I, my daughter made me make sure I say is happy Women's Day. Uh, so it, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be up here. Uh, like I said, I've been in the horse business forever, but I ended up in the banking business. I wanted to be a veterinarian, and then I changed that. I wanted to be an attorney, and I started thinking, if I'm a veterinarian and an attorney, I'll never make any money with my family. 
because they, they'll be always in trouble or they'll be wanting me to do something with a horse. So I took, I took the course of least resistance. I went into banking business. But this gentleman has always been a mentor. Um, I could pick up the phone, and he answered any question. Whether I wanted to hear it or not, he told the truth. And that's what we need in this industry today. You know, I have a bucket list that I have that I've done over the years. And uh, I had never added this to my bucket list, but this is a bucket list that I can check off today. So, Mr. Don, uh, well, uh, please, please, I I'm going to quit talking so I can hear you. Well, i tell you what, I'm not much for doing speeches or anything like that, but uh, I've been fortunate to be able to among a lot of friends, and uh, uh, I've been blessed to be able to be able to do a lot of of these things and uh, today I just have to back up and just uh, watch but uh, I've been around good help all the time good family Ev everything been real good and lucky I was lucky lucky all my life and uh, I've been on the board of the HPPA for many years I represent the quarter horse people and the thoroughbred people I, I don't have any qualms about both of them are my favorite horses. So uh, we'll just leave it at that, and thank you all for being here. Well, I left out one thing. I said he has three kids, a lot. He has four kids. <laughs> yeah. He has June, who has been with him for 65 years. Yeah. And is just like his son, and he treats him just like his son. So, yeah. so uh, he, he's been a loyal person. He's at on the job every morning at 5.30, seven days a week, and I, I, he just keeps it going. I don't know how he keeps on doing it, but he keeps it coming coming around in first class. Like I said, I always have good help. So even with that much, said, uh, even on the starting gates, I had some of the best hands that a person could get, and we did a really did a good job. Quicker you get them in, the quicker you get them out. And you have less trouble. So with that said, I don't think that we could have honored a better person here today. And uh, I thank you for all your years of service. And you're not finished yet. You know, <laughs> we're still going to call on you. I'll be around for and, a uh, while. And if we can't get you to do it, I know who to call to get you to do it. Oh, yeah. Your little bulldog, Charlotte. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Charlotte yeah, you know Charlotte had to pick on you. But uh, I think what you're seeing today is that as long as we have HBPA convention, we honor people every year. But I'm prejudiced. I don't think you're ever going to find a better person for the horse industry. So, Mr. Don, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.